All right. Let's continue where we left off last time with the project and the design document. Let's remember why we're doing this. All right? Always important, right? Why are we doing this? We are doing this because we want to make a good project. We want to make a good website, a well-designed website. And how have we defined a, a good website or a well-designed website? We've defined it as one that meets the goals of both the organization that creates it and the users that are using it. All right? That's kind of a higher level than just looking at the fonts and the colors and that kind of stuff. That's a component of it to be sure. Because if you have, if you have a, a, a color scheme, for example, that's unreadable, well, that's going to defeat any content that you have. If you don't have your site organized correctly, if your navigation is poor, uh, if, uh, you know, is, is, is organized in an, in an illogical way. That's going to defeat any good stuff that you have on it. But all those things that we're going to do visually, as far as setting up the navigation, color schemes, fonts, and all that, are meant to serve the content. All right? Are meant to highlight the content, to emphasize the content, to present what you have to say in the best way possible to get your message across. So we don't want to put the cart before the horse, right? We want to uh, make sure that the focus is on the content and on serving the goals of the user. That's why we take this approach. So that's why we do this. It isn't just busy work. It isn't just, uh, you know, uh, frivolous or, or unimportant. It's critical to developing a good website. Now, why do we do this again? We do this to communicate to everyone involved in the project. Typically, you're doing a project for someone else. All right? Now, that someone else could be someone for your company, right? You could be hired at a company and you could be developing their website or enhancing their website, right? We have web developers here at LC, right? Uh, and the, the clients could be the organization itself that you work for. Or you could be sort of a consultant in a consultant's role where someone hires you, either you or your company, to come in and develop a website for them. Either way, typically you're not developing it for yourself. You want to make sure you identify to them that you understand what their needs and goals are and document it and select the best content to best express uh, and best satisfy the goals that the organization has. So you want to communicate to your customer, whether your customer is like someone outside your company or whether it's an internal customer, someone that works for your organization. You also want to communicate it to anyone on your team that's working with you. For larger websites, you may be working with other web developers, right? And it's nice if you can then sort of uh, divide up the project and make sure everyone's on the same page and everyone works together to ensure a common goal. So these design documents are uh, critical for those reasons, all right? Lastly, I would say it's good because it helps you get your ideas down before you actually create the website. All right? A lot of people think that they can just go and just start writing their, uh, their uh, code uh, and just start creating pages without going through this design process. And they think that it's sort of a waste of time. Remember the graph that we drew that talked about finding mistakes and finding omissions. Uh, the earlier that you can find something, uh, the easier it's going to be to correct. Uh, and it's just a way of capturing ideas, to think it through. If you write a paper, you know, go to any English class, and most English professors will tell you, it's better to write a paper by first coming up with an outline. Or let's say you're doing a speech, come up with an outline. 
here's the main topics I want to talk about. Here's the points we're going to make uh, underneath each topic and so on. Gets your thoughts down. Allows you to create it, think about it, alter it, get it down on paper before you actually do it. Then you come up with rough drafts, right? You might write a paper and rough draft, maybe get feedback from your teacher or for other people, and then you have a final product. The design pro uh, process for a website is very similar to that. The outline is sort of the part of the design document that happens first. The goals, the requirements, the other elements. Then you create a prototype at the end of the design process, which is like a rough draft. All right. You get feedback on it. You get feedback on that from the uh, client, from the customer, and from other people. And then you go and create the finalized version. So let's go and let's continue looking at the design document. It seems like Canvas is behaving better today than it did last time. All right, last time we covered the strategy section fairly completely, identifying the goals. Topic purpose, three personas, a prioritized list of three of your goals. And when I say your goals, I mean you putting yourself in the role of the organization that's creating the website. Then a prioritized list of three user goals for each persona. And this should be professional should be in a formalized Word document, something that you're going to give to someone else. The next section is the scope section. And the scope section is where you identify the specific content on your page that is going to help you and your users achieve their goals. All right? Sometimes in business strategy or even military strategy, they talk about strategy, and they talk about tactics, all right? Then they talk about operations. Well, strategy is the broad goals that you have in mind. Tactics is what you're going to do to achieve those goals, all right? The specific things that you're going to do to achieve those goals. Now, there should be a relationship between your goals and the requirements. And it should be that the goals that you have, any of the goals that you define, have at least one requirement that lines up with that goal, that supports that goal, that helps you achieve that goal. And the reverse is true too. Every requirement, everything you put on the page uh, that you're going to put somewhere on your website should match up with one of your goals. All right. So let's look at an example of this the goals and the requirements. So, so let's say I'm not going to write all the goals down, I'm just going to write a couple goals down. Let's say we're doing a website for a restaurant. The goals of the restaurant might be to increase revenue, right? That's the goal of almost any organization, right? Even a nonprofit organization, a charity or something, wants to bring in more money. Right? So, <clears throat> so maybe that is one of the goals. And the better that you can express those goals in concrete terms, the better off that you're going to be. So maybe you're going to say, we want to increase revenue by ten percent, something like that, twenty percent, thirty percent. Okay. What are some content that we can put on the website that would uh, help support that goal? That would 
help us achieve that goal. Okay. Okay. Reviews. So the goal would be the goal would be to increase revenue. Let's call that goal O1. O for organization, one for their first goal. And Again, in your assignment, you need O2 and O3. Okay. Uh, let's let's put up here. No, I mean like a restaurant. So you know what you're Okay. Uh, no, I, I understood that. I'm just thinking. I'm, I'm envisioning in my mind what I'm going to write up here next, and I want to make sure there's space for it. So that's a goal. Here's a requirement. Site will show a list of reviews. So that's requirement one. We'll call it requirement one. All right. Now, you should be able to do this. And I don't require you to do it, but it's a good idea to do it. Requirement one goes along with goal 01. So you can actually put next to it R1. And requirement one goes with goal goes with organizational goal one. So I'm going to put 01 next to it. So see how I match them up. All right. Now here's why I want to match them up. When I'm done, I have 12 goals, right? I have three from the organization, three from each of the three personas. So I have user goal one, user goal two, user goal three, user goal four, user goal five, six, seven, eight, and nine. When I'm done, every goal should have at least one requirement next to it, right? That makes sense. If I've identified something as one of the 12 most important things that the website is trying to achieve, it's either one of my most important goals or it's the goal of some of my users. If I've identified something as that important, I better have something on my website that helps achieve that goal. So, maybe another goal of mine is to increase repeat business. All right. If I'm done defining all the requirements, I define, let's say, a dozen requirements, and I don't have something on my site that I think will address that goal, I need to hit the brakes, put it in reverse, and add something on the site to help achieve that goal. All right? So... Maybe it would be make a customer loyalty program or something like that. Sometimes when you're creating a site, you're going to work with other departments. You might work with marketing. And if the website, if, if you identify by talking to the management of the restaurant that you want to cre create repeat business, one of the things you might do is talk to marketing and say, how can we help increase business? And they might say, well, let's come up with a, uh, a customer loyalty program. So... That might be the second thing, second requirement. The site will have info about customer loyalty program. Now sometimes goals 
are sort of complementary. Sometimes it's like two sides of uh, the same sort of issue. Maybe one of my restaurant's goals is to increase the catering business. So maybe my restaurant also does catering. All right, so that might be one of my goals, is to increase the catering business. And maybe one of my user goals is to do something like uh, find a caterer for upcoming event. In which case, the requirement site will contain info about catering options. That would be one requirement that addresses several goals, right? That would address goal 01, right? Get more catering business, you get more revenue. It would address trying to increase your catering business. And it would address this user goal. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. You're not going to have one requirement for every goal. A goal might have several requirements that help achieve that. And the reverse side is true, too. All right, a goal could have several requirements, like this one, R1 and R3 address this goal. This one addresses organizational goal 1, organizational goal 3, and user goal 5. So it's not one-to-one, -one, all right? It's not one-to-one. -one. one goal can be addressed by multiple requirements. One requirement can help address several goals. That's why I think it's a good idea to put next to it some kind of coding. If I remember to do that, I will do that in future assignments and say that it's a requirement to do it. Even if it's not a requirement, it's good for your sanity to do that. All right, it's good to make sure you've completed something. Because here's the idea. If you have a goal, all right, that isn't addressed by some requirement, then you miss the boat. All right? If one of your important goals is, one of your users is to find out employment opportunities, If you've identified that as an important goal of your user and you don't have any requirements that address that, you're missing something. You need to go and add that to your list. Yes? Might be a dumb question, but with the user goals, do they all have to be different? Because uh, I know we're making three different We're making three different personas. Um, yeah, they probably should be unique in some way. Even if it's a slight difference, because, uh, for example, and again, a lot has to do with how you're wording it. Uh, you might have one persona as being a couple that wants to find a place to eat and wants to find a romantic place to eat for some special occasion. You might find another one, a family, and... You might want to find out if there's if the, the restaurant's a good place for a special occasion for them, like a kid's birthday party or something like that. Those are really sort of related goals, but they're different. The one wants to find if it's okay for this scenario. One wants to find if it's okay for that scenario. Think of at, at LC. You know, there are things that um, that um, different students of different categories all would be interested in. So, you know, traditional high school age, people are graduating high school and are going to go to college. They're going to have similar goals to maybe an adult that's coming back to school. 
but there's going to be a shade difference between them. That might be a slightly different focus for them. A person that is enrolled, uh, that is a non-traditional student, might have other responsibilities. So they may be more interested in the delivery method of classes, like is it available online, is it, are there evening classes, and so on. Whereas a more traditional student where going to college is like their focus, first and foremost, maybe they have a part-time job, but it's not like uh, an integral family responsibility, they might have slightly different goals. So I would say make them at least a little bit different, make them shades different. Okay, so if you don't address a goal in your requirements, you miss the boat and you have to go back and revise it. Either, maybe you think back and think, well, maybe that isn't a valuable goal. Maybe I thought it was when I came up with a list of goals, but uh, there's really nothing we can put on the site to address that, so maybe it's not so important. Or you figure out a requirement, which is probably more likely. You say, oh, okay, we better have a employment opportunities, or at least have a place to say, contact us, send your resume to, something like that. Doesn't have to be a big deal, all right? Now, the reverse is also true. If I have a requirement that doesn't match one of the goals, rethink if it's necessary, all right? For example, chef's biography. All right, I might put down as a requirement that we're going to have a biography of the chef. All right, well, does that support any of the goals? Maybe. If it's a prestigious restaurant and, like, you want to show how fancy it is, you could say that your chef studied in France and worked at this restaurant in New York and then in one in Los Angeles and has a great reputation and so on and so forth. If it's a certain kind of restaurant. But if you're going to like a TGI Fridays, you know, you're not probably going to be too interested in the biography of the chef because you probably don't have some, you know, TV chef <laughs> that is working at Fridays. All right. So if you have a requirement up there that doesn't relate to the goals, you probably want to get rid of it. All right. Why do you want to get rid of it? What harm does it have? This is Zeller's rule. I've always wanted to have like a rule named after me, you know, like Murphy's Law or something like that. Zeller's Law is this. Anything you have on your site or on a page could distract people from other stuff on your site or page. So if you have a chef's biography on there and it really doesn't add a lot of value, all right, here, gee, our chef worked at McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's before they came to TGI Fridays. And I'm not saying that to criticize those places. I love all of them, <laughs> all right? But that probably isn't going to convince me to go to a particular restaurant, all right? Um, if you have it as a requirement and it doesn't support the goal, then you probably want to get rid of it, all right? Another thing, and I alluded to this last time, when you're defining requirements, you shouldn't just be restating basic web design principles. You shouldn't say, for example, it's going to be an easy font to read. All right? That's not a requirement. That's pretty much an assumption. The navigation is going to be clear. Well, of course it's going to be clear. All right? Uh, you know, uh, you're going to have, each page is going to have the right amount of content, not too little, not too much. Well, yeah, of course you're going to do that. So neither your requirements nor your goals should simply be restating basic web design principles. All right? They should be specific about your organization and your organization's customers, users, your organization's content. All right? Look at it this way. Both a goal, well, a goal is why people are coming to your site. All right? 
or why you are creating the site. You're not creating the site to show off your skills at developing good navigations. That's not why people are coming to your site. Gee, I'm going to the site to see what a nice navigation it has. People don't do that, right? People come to a site because they want information about the organization, not to look at their web development skills. All right? How many of these should you come up with? Well, I don't know. All right. Are there any other questions? No. Uh, I'll make some observations. Students always want to know, like, how long does it have to be? How many requirements do I need? And I usually try to avoid those questions. You need as many as you need, right? But I know that's not an answer, and I'll try to do better than that. Some observations. Every goal you define should be addressed by at least one of your requirements. Every requirement, you, you should have enough requirements to allow you to make a meaningful project. My guess would be 15 to 20 well-worded requirements would be enough. Well-worded, detailed requirements. So there's a number for you. All right? That number isn't carved in stone. So if you have a case, if you've really thought through and you came up with 12, you can review it with me. I just give you this to have a ballpark figure, all right? Uh, if you have a list of two requirements, you probably need to do more work, all right? If you have a list of 100 requirements, you probably have done too much work, and for your own sake, I'm going to ask you to, to scale it down a little bit. If you're in doubt, send me a draft to review. Now, one thing I try to emphasize in all my classes, uh, if you have a question about an assignment, and this goes for any assignment, email it to me as opposed to putting it in the Dropbox. Uh, because, as you probably all observed now, the way the semester goes, sometimes I fall behind grading. Well, if you've asked me a question and I haven't gotten to grade it yet, uh, I'm not going to see your question until I do get to grade it. If, however, you email it to me, I check my email pretty much daily, all right, in which case I can give you an answer quickly. So it's best to email me questions as opposed to putting them in the Dropbox. The Dropbox is sort of meant for stuff that you think is finished and you think is fine, all right? In other words, it's your best guess that you completed this correctly. So if you have questions like, is this enough requirements? You know, are my goals well worded? Then email that to me. Any question about the requirements phase? All right. The next phase is the structure phase. And the structure phase is where we break down our site into the different pages. And we come up with a hierarchy. And we can do it almost like an organization chart. Now, one thing I mentioned before is that your personas are meant to be your guiding light. All right? And when you're dividing up your content, you should think of how your users are going to see your content, what's the most logical way your users are going to see your content be organized? All right? Now, one nice thing with the web is that you can actually choose to show your content a couple different ways. Our websites are going to be simple enough where that probably won't be necessary. All right? But you would want to think of it from the user's perspective. So let me give you an example. Let's say I run a sporting goods store. Has equipment, has apparel for kids. 
kids, for adults, for a variety of different sports. What are some ways that we could divide that topic? If we had to break it into web pages, what are, what are some ways we could divide the products in a sporting goods store? By the different sports. Okay, so one of my possible structures would be this. Here's my home page. Here is my basketball products page. And maybe there's some things underneath that. Again, a sporting goods store would probably have a lot of pages. Kids, yeah. Stuff like Maybe kids, adults, and so on. Then we could have baseball, softball, swimming, golf whatever the most popular sports were, and then maybe a catch-all for miscellaneous. That's one way that we could organize our stuff. And it's logical, right? It makes sense. What's another way that also makes sense? Yes? Equipment and apparel. Equipment versus apparel. So we could... You think about the profile that you've created for them. 
and you come up with your best guess at how they will view your content. Not how you view your content, but how they will view their content. I think I gave this example before, that at colleges, uh, in the past, and, and in the past it was like this on LC's website, things were broken down by academic division. Well, funny thing is, is information systems, IT, really varies a lot with where it, what division it fits under if you go from college to college. For some colleges, it's in the business division. For other colleges, it's in engineering. For other colleges, it's in math and science. All right? Therefore, it wouldn't be good to have stuff broken down just by academic division. All right? Because people in the outside world don't know that at this college, IT is in the business division, and this college, IT is in engineering. It might be more appropriate to have it broken down by career area, for example. That if you want to get into information technology, here are your options. All right? So you're going to come up with one of these. And when you're done, you'll justify it in some way. All right? You'll, you'll say, here's why I think this is a better solution. All right? So you'll pick one of these, and that will be the organization that you make, and then you will justify it and say why you chose that method. Now, in larger web projects with large development teams, sometimes they actually make up prototypes, all right, that are organized differently. And they bring in like a test group, a focus group, and say, let's imagine you had to do this. How would you do it? And they actually video record them trying to navigate the site, and they see which organization works better or worse. That's great when you're working on large kinds of projects and they have lots of resources. But in the absence of that, you sort of have to take your best guess based on what you know about your audience and what you know about the content and what you know about how your audience views the content. Uh, I did a couple summer things, uh, fellowships at NASA, and they talked about their usability lab. And they had a project to revise their website that had their forms, their internal documents, you know, government forms. like. So if you want to request a vacation, there's a vacation form. If you wanted to file an expense report, you went on a business trip, all right, to do that. And as you can imagine, with any government agency, right, there's like a lot of forms, right? And they actually did that. They organized them different ways. And they actually observed in their usability lab people trying to navigate through the system. They said, okay, let's pretend you just went on a business trip and had to file out a expense report. Can you find it? All right, and they would observe them and they would see, you know, and if they found it within a couple of clicks, that was good. If they took a couple paths down the navigation tree, realized they were in the wrong place and backed up and tried again, that was bad. And based on that, they decided on the best way to organize the data. Again, I doubt that you will have the time and the resources to do that, uh, so you take your best guess. That is where a prototype will come in handy, though. All right, and we'll talk about the prototype in a minute here. Either in a minute or in 48 hours, <laughs> depending on if I can fit it in or not. So, the structure phase, you should produce a diagram like this. Like one of these, not all of them, just one of them. And explain why you chose that organization. Because remember, no matter what organization you choose, there's alternatives. We talked about a website about jazz music. You could break it down by era. You could break it down by style. You could break it down by musical instrument. Now, which one of those things is most, val uh, is most valuable for the users? Well depends who you believe your users are. If your users are musicians, maybe by instrument would be a good thing, right? Because if you're a saxophone player, you might want to study other saxophone players, right? 
and so on down the line. If you're just a listener, maybe by style would be better. Gee, I heard this recording and someone told me that it was, uh, it was from the big band era. All right. What are some other big bands or some modern big bands that are playing? All right. Would be a good way to, to organize it. That might be a goal of the person. So you'll create one of these and you'll explain why you pick that as opposed to any of the alternatives. All right. We'll get through the wireframe and we won't get into the prototype until next time. So we'll have one more section, a couple minutes. We'll talk about the prototype next time. A prototype, just to give you a warning, is where you actually are going to create some HTML pages. All right. Uh, consider them to be rough drafts. But we'll talk about more uh, next time. What is a wireframe? A wireframe is like a template for some or all of your pages. And it's not in detail. It just shows sort of the main sections of the page. So maybe you say your page is going to look like this. It's a very typical layout for a page. Maybe you're going to have a banner here. Navigation on the bottom. A footer here with an email address, phone number, address, terms and conditions, etc. Maybe your main content area is here, and here you're going to have news stories. That's a wireframe. All right? Now, please don't everyone turn in this exact thing, you know, because, you know, you can have other wireframes. Now, for a small website, you may only need one wireframe. You may only need one wireframe. You might have a couple of wireframes, though. For example, maybe your home page has different organization than the rest of the pages. Maybe your home page has a giant image with a banner here navigation here and a footer one of those things I talked about where you use transparency and all that, so you can see the big image, but you can also see the content on there. So maybe your home page has a different layout than the rest of your pages. Or maybe there are certain pages that look different than other pages. Maybe you have a photo gallery page on your site, all right? In which case, maybe The banner's like this. The navigation is like this. No. I'm going to still put the navigation down the side, but maybe there's thumbnails underneath the banner. And then you have the big picture. And maybe there isn't news on the photo gallery page. And then you have your footer. The pages on your website should have a consistent layout, a consistent look and feel. But remember, consistent doesn't mean they need to look all identical. All right? If there's a reason to make a page look a little bit different than the rest of the pages, then do it. For example, the home page. The home page is sort of your face to the world, your web face to the world. All right? In which case, maybe you make that look a little bit different. All right? Gallery pages serve a specific certain need. So maybe they're going to look different than pages that have a lot of text on them. All right? 
That being said, you probably will not need more than three wireframes. You might get by with one. All right? Maybe you need two. Maybe, in extreme cases, you'll have three. Something for your home page, something for the rest of your pages, and something for a page or two that are, that are exceptions for whatever reason. All right? Maybe your terms and condition page looks different, for example. These are templates. And again, I don't have you documenting this. One thing I wish I would revise the assignment for is that structure diagram, ideally you should be able to point to each requirement and say what page it's going to be on. So when I do my structure diagram on my six or seven pages, I should be able to say requirement one is going to be on page one. Requirements three and four are going to be on page two, and so on down the line. Same thing here. I should be able to say which of my pages are going to follow this wireframe. Home page is going to be this. Gallery page is going to be this. The rest of the pages on the site are going to be this. All right? Yes? Can we do it in a PowerPoint? You can, you can represent it any way that you want to. Uh, so if you want to mock it up in Word, if you want to uh, do it in PowerPoint, that's fine. Uh, Illustrator, any tools that you know are, are, are fair game for it. To do the wireframe, though, you probably don't want to do it in HTML. All right? That's the prototype. These are literally sketches. You know, if you had meetings with a client, maybe you would sit down with them with a pad of paper and actually manually sketch and say, what do you think of this layout? What do you think of this layout? And so on. All right? Next time we'll discuss the prototype, which is a very critical part of the design process. Are there any questions now? All right, we'll see you in lab. I'll go unlock lab, then I'll be back to grab my files.